Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another My JavaScript Story. Um, in case you're wondering or on the Angular feed, this is also going to go on to My Angular Story, so you are in the right place. Uh, this week, we're talking to Jeff Cross. Jeff, do you want to say hi? Hello. Um, now, we've had you on both shows, I believe, both JavaScript Jabber and Adventures in Angular. Um, uh, yeah, I think so. And uh, yeah, just interesting stuff. You've been involved in Angular for a while, and I think that's how we know each other. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, we're going to try and capture your story and let people know, you know, how you got into all of this. And, and what, what I try and do is kind of paint a picture for people so that they can feel like, oh, well, if I have something in common with Jeff, then I can, you know, I can get to where he is. Or, you know, I have some hope of learning to program as well as he does, um, as well as just put a human face on programming. I think a lot of times we we get people on, we talk about technology for an hour and then we j jump off. And I don't think people realize, you know what, these are people, they have families, they have lives, they, ha you know, they have friends, mm -hmm. they, they go out and get a beer or coffee with people, and, you know, they're humans as well. So, yeah, all of that in 45 minutes. You ready? All right, let's go. I think people may just be disappointed. I'm not really much of a human. I, I don't remember the last time I went out and actually did anything fun, but, uh, <laughs> but we'll, we'll give it a try. You have kids, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. Um, but anyway, uh, do you want to just give a brief introduction before we get going too far? Sure. Uh, so I'm Jeff Cross. I, um, I've been on the Angular team for, well, so I, I guess technically now I'm like former Angular team. I, I still like to consider myself part of the Angular team, but I've been working on Angular for, uh, the past five years now, um, uh, four years at Google on the Angular team. And for the past year have been working at Narwhal, which Victor Safkin and I co-founded at the end of 2016. Um, and so that's where most people would know me from, uh, from uh, the uh, different parts of Angular I helped work on. Cool. Well, before we get to Angular, let's start at the very beginning and get your story on how you got into programming. Sure. Um, should I just start from the start? I was yeah. born, born in the 80s. Um, I, I don't consider myself a millennial, though. Um, but uh, actually, I'll, I'll skip ahead a little bit. I was uh, born in the uh, 70s, so I can, I'll call you okay. a baby. Yeah, you're, you're like, so I'm on the edge of millennial, so I tried not to not to group myself in with millennial, uh, because uh, unless it's beneficial, you know, if I'm hanging out with other millennials, and I'm like, yeah, I'm totally one of you. Um, but uh, so I actually, I got started in programming when I was, I, I think I was about 12 years old, and my, my mom was an intranet webmaster for a music distributor called BMG, which I don't know if they're still around. They, but their business really suffered when the internet happened. And um, I remember ordering uh, uh, like 11 CDs for $2. Or yeah, something. exactly. Yeah, that, that was a lot of their business. Uh, so yeah, they, they made a lot of, uh, they had these clubs that you would, uh, yeah. they and Columbia house were the big ones who did this, where you would send in like a dime and they'd be like, okay, your first CD is only a dime. And then the fine print is, uh, you know, we'll charge you 50 bucks a month for more CDs uh, yep. for per perpetuity and good luck canceling it. Um, but uh, so that's how I, you know, I made my living it was uh, was through sc scamming people out of their dimes and, and their uh, follow up subscriptions. But um, actually, I don't think it was quite that bad. But uh, um, my mom was the was the Internet master, I think, just for one of the divisions. Uh, I don't know if the whole company, but. Um, so she had kind of, I don't know how she ended up doing that role cause she didn't have really a background in technology, but she had done some design and, 
and some um, uh, like making newsletters and things like that. So somehow ended up being the internet webmaster, which I, I think was a pretty content heavy position. Uh, but then as part of that, she had to learn how to do HTML, some web development. And so she taught me and my siblings uh, things like using front page to make websites and how to edit the source to, to change the layout. And, um, you know, was, I don't think CSS was, was really a thing yet. And uh, so it was all tables and uh, throw some images in there, make some borders, like make some interesting things. And so uh, so that's that's really kind of how I got into it to start with. Boy, you're taking me back. <laughs> oh yeah, I didn't. I didn't mention any of the other editors. Like uh, maybe you use this one, but I remember Netscape Navigator used to have a built-in editor uh, that I used for. I forget what that was called, but um, they had like this cool WYSIWYG editor that you could also edit things with. And and then then Dreamweaver and Go Live became yeah. the yeah the more preferred tools, um, which I guess they I think they yeah Go Live eventually went away right in favor of Dreamweaver. I think it's still a thing. Um, I don't but, remember uh, honestly. Most of my stuff was on GeoCities, and oh yeah, I would just type yeah, G- right into the browser. Yeah, I um, yeah, I used to have a GeoCities. Uh, that was my first playground. Was I, I just had a, a GeoCities page that had a bunch of gifs on it and sound bites, and like just I would find random sound clips of Toy Story or Seinfeld or I, I don't remember uh-huh. Qu- quotes I didn't even know the context of, but were cool sound bites, and would throw them on the page. Which I, I tried to find my old GeoCities page the other day on on archives, but couldn't. Uh, apparently, wasn't worth saving or archiving, so haven't been successful. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, if I ever find it, I'll let you know. Awesome. I did have a cool GIF that just that I recorded myself saying "Welcome to my website," and then I had a GIF that was just like really janky, had my mouth moving up and down <laughs> as if it was talking, um, which would have been good to preserve. That that is awesome. <laughs> nice. So, how how did you get into JavaScript then? I started off really focused on design, and and for a lot of years, I I was more of a web designer, and I I spent most of my time in Photoshop, coming up with web site designs for friends and my my church youth group and mm-hmm. what whoever whoever would let me work on a. Uh, a, a website from I was in a band with some friends and so we I had I did like 10 websites for that band um yeah, but but it was mostly focused on design and I didn't really get too much dynamic uh, stuff but as I started getting more into flash it was a nice bridge and I, I hear the story from a lot of people that flash is kind of the way they got into programming from mm-hmm. from design um like so when I got into flash and it was like you could make these amazing animations and like you can make nice intros and everything without doing anything programmatic. But when I started realizing that you could actually add these hooks, like you could actually run some scripts on keyframes or, or make it more interactive, then that's when I started experimenting with ActionScript back in the ActionScript 1 or 2 days, mm-hmm. 1.0, 1. 2.0. Um, and uh, and I, I had, at, up to that point, I, was, I had always seen programming as this thing that was kind of not f- – not something I could learn or it was too hard. And like I was a designer, I should stick with design. Uh, but I started experimenting and just like copy pasting scripts from, from, uh, I don't know what the stack overflow was back then, but I would just Google things and find scripts to paste and, and slowly kind of figure it out. And, uh, that was my first foray into actual programming. And, and then I joined an agency that was really big into flash. And this was more, this was like years later when I was, in my twenties and, um, uh, the, this, this was an agency in Phoenix called Terra Lever. They had some of the best flash people in the, in the business and, uh, action script three was a thing then. And, and I started to see like, it's, it was more object oriented. That's when they had classes, interfaces, more, more, uh, complex patterns, um, more, uh, just real, really interesting programming you could do where it wasn't just throw a script on a keyframe and do something, but you could actually actually build an application and action script that is bound to these movie clips and, and screens and stages. And so um, I learned. So there I started learning from the people I was working with, some of the, the cooler ideas of programming. Like that was kind of my first foray into object oriented programming um, and, uh, and started so that was a really good learning time. So I was, you know, helping make stuff for clients and, and learning alongside some great people. And 
and had so like my friend Richie, who I've worked with a lot since then, uh, was working there, and he really helped uh, explain a lot of things and showed me the ropes, so to speak. And uh, that's when I started getting more into into programming in general. And then around 2009, when iPhone made it clear that Flash wasn't going to be a target for the iPhone, uh, I started looking more to JavaScript, which I had done some to that mm-hmm. point. Um, but it was at that point I I, um, I joined another company called called Unicon in the uh, Phoenix area and started working on a uh, an accelerator titanium project, which is mm-hmm. a you know it's there are things like it now, but it was one of the first JavaScript runtimes for mobile where you could actually right. have native mobile elements with so where where you could have JavaScript that's driving it. Um, and so I helped build a an open source university portal that worked with this existing project called UPortal, and uh, I was working alongside a, a friend named Jen Bory, who who uh, she actually went to Google just before I did, and, and she she and I continue to collaborate because uh, she's working on the Google Cloud platform now, which is using Angular. Um, but she so she was another big step in helping me because she's a she's a really sharp programmer, more of a computer science background, and a really nice person otherwise. And so I was thrown into this project, basically leading this project with a, with a decent amount of Flash and ActionScript experience at this point, but still kind of filling out JavaScript. And so uh, she was really helpful in, in helping me to kind of explore, build this thing, when we worked on this uh, this thing together. And that was, that was basically when I was fully converted to JavaScript and really haven't gone back to Flash since. That's interesting. And it's funny, I mean, you're telling this story, and I talked to Merritt Christensen earlier today. Uh, mm-hmm. for this same podcast and his story parallels yours quite a bit. You know, he, he came to JavaScript sooner than Steve Jobs killed Flash, but still, you know, it, it's funny to me how many people come up through, I did design, I did some, you know, some basic stuff, went through Flash and then, mm-hmm. yeah, they moved into, um, you know, the Angulars and Reacts and Views and Backbones and Knockouts and things like that mm-hmm. to try and find ways to do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, Backbone was, uh, I was really excited about that when it came out. That was one of the first web MVC projects that I, I'd done. And, and uh, yep. yeah, it was, it, was, it was like, whoa, this is pretty cool how, how uh, like, it was encapsulation when encapsulation didn't really exist in any other mm-hmm. libraries. Like jQuery, you know, was, is, uh, was what I had done to that point, which was just like, toss it anywhere, you know, grab whatever you want to. The DOM is your playground. Yep. Yeah, the infamous jQuery spaghetti. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, you know, it was such a powerful tool that, you know, we didn't have anything like it when it came out. I mean, there were other things, I guess, like it, but it just it, yeah. it made a lot of those things much more possible and much more consistent across the web, which made it really nice. Yeah, exactly. You didn't really have to think too much about different browsers. Uh, yeah, it's such a good job. Yeah, I, jQuery is a really good on ramp for a lot of JavaScript developers. Yeah. So so how do you go from doing JavaScript at Google to Angular? So. So when I I was working at, at Unicon on this mobile thing that I was talking about, um, I was I was starting to look get more into Node programming. Uh, uh-huh. So that because you know if you're just doing client side, you're pretty limited on the kind of things you can develop. And I had been experimenting with building some personal applications, and I'd used like Google App Engine and Python, and and then had moved into Node. But um, I uh, as part of that, I was realizing that that uh, there were a lot of things like setting up APIs was really tedious and setting up anything, anything meaningful on the back end required a lot of ceremony to get it right. Even with frameworks like express, like you're, if you just want to have a JSON endpoint, you want some simple CRUD operations. It, it still was a lot of thinking you had to do. And so I'd start talking with my friend, Richie Martori, whom I had worked with at, at Terralever about some thoughts I was having about uh, creating a back end product or something back end project that would make a lot of this simpler. And so he and I prototyped this new project called Deployed, which was, Mm -hmm. it's like the word deployed, but take away the last E. And, uh, and we worked on it for a few months, just like on, on vacations or breaks, I would fly out where he was living in, in the Bay area before I lived here. And, um, he and I would hack on it and really started to see a lot of potential in, in this. And, uh, and so we decided to quit our jobs and uh, start a company, start deployed as a company and focus on building this open source platform, which was one of the first back ends as a service before that was a thing. And um, and so we started this this company in 20, 
2011 or 2012, mm-hmm. where we uh, where we were basically he and I and, and another guy who we'd work with part time, Dallin Feldner, uh, started working on this and doing some consulting on the side where we would do some node or JavaScript development for, for clients while also working on this open source platform that we were trying to make into a commercial product. And um, we worked on it for a year and actually it, it got some pretty good traction. Like it, uh, uh, it was getting adopted even as tools like Firebase, uh, which I'm, I'm now friends with the founders, but at the time hadn't, didn't know them and, uh, and tools like parse. And, uh, there was another one called stack mob. And there, there was, there was a few who yeah. entered the space around the same time. Uh, so it, it wasn't an original idea at all. It was like something obvious in the evolution of, of, um, of web products. But, um, so we, we worked on that for a year and, we we had gotten traction, but really hadn't found commercial viability or um, or had funding or anything. So we were this bootstrap company, and around the end of the year, I had told my wife like either we hit certain revenue milestones or have funding, or I'll I'll quit the company and move on to something else because we had just had our first kid, and that was the only way I could talk her into letting me quit my stable job to start a company. So uh, so at the end of the, that year, it wasn't quite commercially viable or where we wanted. So we decided to, uh, to move on and, and get, get real jobs. And so I, uh, I had actually been talking with Brad Green from the Angular team at that point, because there are a lot of people who are using deployed with Angular applications and found it really interesting. And, and he found it interesting too. And so, uh, I'd met with him and, and said, Hey, so probably going to be moving on. You think I could come work on the Angular team? And, you know, you know, Brad's pretty good at, at getting things together quickly if, um, uh, you know, if, if he'd like to. So he, he got, uh, some interviews for me and, and, uh, uh, yeah, I, I barely made it through as far as I can tell the, the Google interview process <laughs> uh, it, it's really hard without a computer science background to get into Google. Um, and, uh, so, but, uh, I think, I think I had enough other good things going for me that, that it made up for that. And so got, got in and, uh, joined the Angular team in 2013, early 2013, kind of when Angular was, it was, it already had momentum, but it was pretty early on and it's starting to get traction and, and to become what it is today. So what kinds of things have you con- con- contributed to Angular? Like what parts of so, the framework had, did, were you working on? Was it everything or just certain parts? The, a lot of the first two years was a lot of Angular JS 1.x just bug fixes, minor enhancements. Basically it was, you know, whatever, whatever needs to be worked on. Most of the team was in that mode where it was, it was getting popular really fast. The community was growing really fast. The, there were all these, these little, um, either developer experience issues or performance issues that we would just kind of take it as it came and, and, uh, improve what was there, maybe change the APIs a little bit, fix complex bugs, that kind of thing. So I'd say the, the first two years were a lot of that. And then in, um, uh, 2014, late 2014 and, and, uh, early 2015, I may be off by a year on some of these, but, uh, then we all started shifting gears towards angular two, as we called it at the time. And, uh, at that point, we gradually shifted folks from Angular JS, the, at least folks on the core team. We shifted from Angular JS to then focusing on Angular two one by one. And so, as as things like the initial compiler and data binding were were ready to go, then then I shifted over, started working on the a lot of the data persistence side of things, like the HTTP library. Uh, I was the uh, the author of, and uh, and uh, then. Uh, I'm trying to think what other parts. So I was involved with a couple of other parts more as a ad hoc contributor, like some of the change detection, uh, some of pipes design and implementation. I was a little bit involved with forms, but the main things I was working on was HTTP. And then down the road more took, uh, took over the mobile efforts on the team. So basically working with people outside of the Angular team and working on our own progressive web app story. Mm-hmm. So we, uh, Alex Rickabaugh, Rob Wormald, a couple other contributors, and I spun off a, a team, uh, the Angular mobile team, which I was the tech lead of. And we we spent basically a year making the progressive web app story good with Angular, making sure the load time performance uh, was was good and helping to make it good by default. So focusing on like service worker caching, uh, better minification, app shell, so that you can have uh, a shell on the screen as soon as possible. 
And um, so that was a lot of what, where I ended up on the Angular team was working on uh, the, the mobile story, which was really exciting to be part of and really exciting to see some of the, the fruits of that now in the community really embracing progressive web apps. That's awesome. I, I'm, I just love all of the, oh, we're, we're, we're going to work on this now. You know, we like the progressive web apps. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, just figuring it out, getting the people together and just making it work. Yeah, that was a great experience, too, because it was a good opportunity for us to collaborate with the Chrome team more, which mm -hmm. which we we'd had some light collaboration with before. But um, but I would I would have I think all of us would have liked to have had more like Polymer and Angular. There were more similarities that it would have been good to, to share some things on. But progressive web apps was a, a good thing that both of our teams cared a lot about. And so uh, like Adi Osmani was really uh, really involved with our efforts and, and giving advice and and. Um, us being able to reach out and get his input on things. And so, uh, yeah, it was, it was a good thing to get the teams talking more, collaborating more, sharing more ideas and things like that. Nice. Do you have any embarrassing stories about Brad? I just have to ask. Uh, about Brad? No. I mean, I've, Mishko is probably the most person I have embarrassing stories about. Oh, good. So, uh, I'll give you one Mishko story. Like br <laughs> Brad, Brad, I don't know. He's, He's just got this grace about him that uh, uh, yeah. he handles every situation well. I, I, I don't know that he's ever been embarrassed. Um, but uh, Mishko, so one time, so I've had a beard for the past, I don't know, how decade or so mm -hmm. all the time. And my whole time on the Angular team, I'd had a beard. And uh, one day, I think in 2015, I, I shaved my beard. Like my wife dared me to shave it. And um, and so I shaved it. And then when I went to work, I printed myself a guest badge that said Frank Cross on it so that I would look like so that I could you know convince people I wasn't actually Jeff. And, um, <laughs> and so I was <laughs> I was standing at my desk with my guest badge on and, and Mishko walked by my desk and he, he did a double take and like, you know, did his kind of confused Mishko look. And uh, and I made up some kind of voice, which I'm not going to try now. Uh, but I said, oh, I'm Jeff's brother, Frank. Jeff's over in the, the kitchen making coffee. And Mishko kind of looked at me to you know, decide if I was telling the truth or not. And then so he he turned around and went to the kitchen to see if Jeff was actually <laughs> there. And then <laughs> came back and, and knew I had gotten him, uh, which I had actually uh, there are a few people on the team. Who, who I think I got, but I, they, everyone was on the cusp. Like they kind of I, I you know, I play a lot of jokes on the team. So everyone kind of knew that. It was probably me, but they were being polite and didn't want to be mean to my brother if it really was my brother. So <laughs> that's awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'd like to bring that up. Yeah, it's funny. Um, since the last Angular conference I've been to, I've grown a beard and I I got some glasses. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, it's funny. I've been walking through the conference center during the workshops the last day or two, and you know people mm -hmm. kind of look at me and then they look down at my badge and then. You see their head jerk back up to look at my face again. Oh, oh the podcast oh, really guy. <laughs> that's funny. That's a terrific story. Yeah. So that's, that's a typical Mishko. Yeah. He's a he's a fun guy, but he, he trusts people a little too much, I guess. <laughs> yep. Trust trust me too much anyway. Yep. So what what is it like working on the Angular team? I mean, is is there a way you can paint that picture, or is it just you kind of have to be there? It's terrible. Uh, I'm just kidding. No, it's actually it was really exciting. That, that's certainly the the period of my life where I grew the most as an engineer uh, because I even though I'd been doing programming for a few years before joining the team, it, it was, there was so much more that I learned just about general programming discipline and the and like good habits of, of good engineering and a lot more than just how you write code, you know, like how you approach problems um, and how you how you solve those problems, how you how you do things more incrementally. You don't try to you know, fix everything at once. Like be really pragmatic. Mm -hmm. um, so it was in like the people on the team, like the the uh, the leads of like Igor and Mishko, that just have so much experience and um, they're so good to learn from. And then everyone else on the team has just diff different depths and different areas that you can really learn a lot from. And they're all, everyone's really approachable in Google in general. I found that to be true that, that um, if you have an interest in something that someone else is deep in, then they're happy to do lunch and talk about things with you and, uh, and uh, you know, kind of share their ideas and, and answer questions, things like that. 
Um, but uh, even the maturity, other other than engineering, like the, the the leads of the team, Brad, Igor, Mishko, are just really mature people, and and it it becomes important when there are challenging times in the community, like when uh, like we had a lot of uh, people upset when we when it became clear that we were rewriting Angular, and yeah. and uh, there was a lot of a lot of negativity in the community, and just um, you know the way they respond to to attacks and negativity and things like that is uh, just really shows the, the maturity that, uh, you know, it's not emotional or, or aggressive. It's like, we want to be empathetic. We want to listen. We want to figure out how to make this right. Uh, we want to acknowledge that, that um, we could have done things better. Um, and even like when it comes to other frameworks getting popular and then people making it into a framework war, uh, the way they've handled those kinds of things is also just, um, it's really good to be part of a team who, who doesn't get caught up in those kinds of things and, and uh, handles it in the right way. So I've learned a lot, both engineering wise and just general uh, maturity from being on the team. Makes sense. And that's something that I've admired as well. Uh, I, I see a lot of people trying to make it into a framework war and mm -hmm. yeah, they're, they're pretty good about just, well, you know, try and see which one you want. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, exactly. So one thing that I'm curious about is Narwhal. So how, how did that get started? So, I had I, I deployed and before before TerraLever and like in that in between time, I'd actually done a lot of consulting. I, I ran a small web agency for about a decade um, and then had worked in consulting companies that, that all the whole time up until Google. And as I was getting more of the itch to get back into the um, getting out into the real world, like where people are using the framework and seeing uh -huh. Uh, like I, I just like this kind of talking with many teams, seeing their problems, solving those kinds of problems. Less like I really like the. It was an interesting challenge to be working on a framework, um, but it was too abstract for me to keep doing forever. And so I, I had been getting that itch to you know get out, start another business because I like I like starting, I like being an entrepreneur, um, and to also like be out there and see the real world and and be touching right. real applications that are using Angular, and so. Um, at the same time, uh, Victor and I, Victor Safkin and I had, had uh, we had been friends on the team for some time, and he mentioned to me that he was planning to move back to Toronto, and, and as part of that would would be leaving Google, and so uh, he and I had kicked around the idea of of working together, uh, and then just one day said, okay, we need to decide. Like it's Angular two has just been released. Um, if we're going to do it, now's the time to do it. Um, so we, we decided right after Angular 2.0 final was done uh, that we would we even start a company focused on Angular and focused on helping teams um, upgrade to Angular, move to Angular, or you know just really do Angular in a way that scales to big enterprise teams and, and to really leverage Angular to it to its uh, most potential to help teams be effective and build applications at scale and all that good stuff. Awesome. That, that I, I just I love to just the stories of people going out and creating something. And so, yeah, just seeing an opportunity and seeing that, you know, you're going to get what whatever it is that you want from it, you know, so you mm -hmm. go out and create it. I mean, I think that's terrific. Yeah, I'm sure you, you can relate to be an entrepreneur yourself. Yeah, uh, but it has been really exciting. I mean, we've we've got to work with a lot of great teams. Um, uh, we were almost up to 10 people now at the company. Um, still hiring. Uh, so we have a lot more demand than we can keep up with, so we're we're hiring at a pace that's not going to overwhelm us. But uh, you know, still still growing the company, uh, finding new ways to scale to to help more customers. Um, but it's been really exciting, and it's it's really exciting the group of people that we've got together, like some of the the top brains in the Angular community and and nicest people in the Angular community too. Yeah, it's kind of funny because. Uh I've I've wound up either interviewing for this show or you know having as guests on Adventures in Angular people from uh, Narwhal and it's just funny because it's like oh you're at Narwhal now too and, you know <laughs> yeah. you seem to be picking up yeah a lot of the big thinkers out there in the community and just you know digging into what they're doing it's just it's just really yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's a nice cycle. I mean, the more interesting, cool people you hire, the more that other cool, interesting people want to join you. So, um, yeah, we're we're at a lucky spot, and you know, want to want to keep that keep that advantage. Yep. So, what else are you working on these days? Is it mostly Narwhal, or do you have other projects in the works that you want to talk about? The uh, 
Uh, so I'm completely focused on Narwhal, the, uh, but we've got a lot of interesting things at Narwhal that we've been working on. NX is, is the big project we launched last year, last October. And um, that's that's basically our set of extensions. It's Narwhal extensions for, for Angular. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's just a, a wrapper around Angular CLI that uses the, the uh, schematics API from Angular CLI to make it easier to generate more idiomatic code so like more opinionated code that um like with state management with routing excuse me no with a lot of things that um that people that we recommend people do we've made it easier to do by default with nx and one big part of nx is how it organizes code differently than a standard Mm -hmm. angular cli project so instead of in Angular CLI, you have a single application with a single source tree under the SRC directory. We have it where there are two top-level directories, one for apps and one for libs, the libraries. Uh-huh. And uh, and an app is basically something that gets bundled and deployed. And a library is anything that be, is consumed by an app or consumed by other libraries. And as part of NX, we have linting rules that enforce that libraries have explicit public APIs that can't be circumvented. And so, uh, so instead of having all your code jumbled in the same source tree, maybe in the same ng module, it uh, now you have these explicit libraries, like for your common components library, or maybe for certain parts of your state will be their own libraries. Uh, you, you have it where you can encapsulate these libraries, write focus tests for these libraries, and not export the bits of the library you don't want to be seeing outside of the library, and which makes it easier for teams to. Um, one, you have clear separation, better testability, clearer ownership of who owns which parts of your application, but also refactoring becomes much easier, which is a, a big challenge we've seen with with the large teams that we've been working with. Uh-huh. And so, um, so that's been a really exciting project, and we keep on evolving that. Uh, I think almost all of our customers have moved to it, and everyone has, you know, call me biased, but the the Everyone loves it, <laughs> at least my experience, even even with some of its warts, like there's still some things that are awkward with with um, its relationship to Angular CLI, just like NPM and node module resolution, like some weird things there. But even so, like uh, we've just seen lots of positive feedback for it and we're really excited about that. Uh, awesome. And we've got some other things, other things we've been working on, too. Like we, we just released our our first online training course called uh, or the the portal is called angular enterprise playbook at angularplaybook.com mm-hmm. and the first course is, is an in-depth course on how to make use of the nx workspace and it's free and uh, and that's something that we're going to keep investing in putting more content out there uh, basically taking the things we've seen work with the teams that we work with trying to make it more accessible to to everyone in the community nice we should have you on adventures in angular to talk about it yeah, definitely. And and we'll have some more courses published soon, so definitely will be some interesting things to talk about. Nice. All right. Well, the last portion of the show is picks. This episode is sponsored by Linode. Linode is offering listeners of this podcast a $20 credit, which is good for four free months at their lowest plan. Their plans start at one gigabyte of RAM for $5 a month. You can get your servers in any of their 10 data centers, and their high memory plans start at 16 gigabytes. Get a server running in under a minute. They do hourly billing with a monthly cap on all plans and add-on services like backups, node balancers, long view, etc. VMs for full control, running Docker containers, encrypted disks, VPNs, etc. You can run a private Git server. They provide native SSD storage, 40 gigabit network, and Intel E5 processors. They have 24-7 friendly support, even on holidays, and a seven-day money-back guaranteed. So go check them out at linode.com slash myangularstory. Um, Are there things you want to shout out about? There was uh, the only, I had one that came to mind because I I was looking at the email this morning. I was like, oh, I I need to think of picks. The thing is that I've been happy. I mean, I'm happy with lots of things. Uh, I have lots of tools that I use all the time. But one app that I've really come to like more, and I've been using it for about six months, is the Things app for Mac OS and Mm -hmm. iOS. Um, The downside is you have to really buy into iOS and Mac OS to make use of it. Um, but but it's a really great to do management task management app like just really it's really simple but powerful like it it manages the power in a nice way without the without becoming complicated or, or overwhelming um, but it's uh, I found it to be a good it matches my mental model for how I'd like to plan my time 
And uh, so I, I found that to be a great tool to, to use. So it's, it, and it costs money too. So, but you know, it's worth it. Uh, and uh, actually there may be a trial version of it. I'm not sure, but it's a, it's a great Mac and iOS app and Victor uses it too. Um, I think he, he switched to iPhone. I think a large part so he could use the things app on his phone instead of his Android phone. So that, right. that could tell you um, how good of an app it is. Cool. I'm going to jump in here with a few picks as well. Um, mm -hmm. I've been playing with all kinds of stuff lately. And uh, one of the things that um, I've really been liking is uh, the Apple AirPods. Um, mm. I've, I've been wearing them for the last few weeks. I got some when I was at CES uh, just so that I have something to compare it to because I got a couple of other pairs of wireless headphones. I wanted, you know, people are like, well, how does it compare to those? And I didn't have any. So I got some and I'm, I'm really, really liking them. So I'm going to pick that. Um, and then, yeah, I just overall. Just what, the, they, what do you like about them? Is it the uh, the sound quality or just the convenience the sound, of connectivity? The sound quality is nice. Um, I like that I can walk across the room without being tied to my phone. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you can't go too terribly far, but I, you know, I can, I can cross a room, a large room, and they'll still work just fine. Um, the the call quality on them is pretty darn good. And, um, the only issue that I really have with them is when I try and switch from one device to another. So mm -hmm. like I was uh, watching a show on my iPad <laughs> and then I switched it over back over to my, um, my phone so I could listen to a podcast and it, it kind of had some issues there the last time I did it, but usually that works somewhat smoothly. And I love that mm -hmm. you can just put them in the case, open it up next to your iPhone and it says, Oh, I found your, your AirPods. Mm -hmm. So you see, yeah, you don't have to cool. go through the the pairing rigmarole and all that garbage. Um, cool. But yeah, yeah. I've yeah, actually been thinking about getting a pair. So that's it's because uh, I've, I've got these Bose headphones, which are awesome for sitting at my desk. But there are lots of times when earbuds are much better. Yeah. Well, these ones sit in your ear. They don't go into your ear canal. The other two pair that I have that I'm going to be trying one I I used for a while uh, were the Broggy Pro headphones and mm -hmm. they cost a little bit more than the uh airpods um and uh the other one that i haven't opened up yet are from crazy baby and they're their pro version they're supposed to be waterproof and so i'm gonna take them swimming mm -hmm. and see how that works but um anyway the the broggies and these crazy baby ones insert into your ear canal and so if that bothers you then they're probably a non-starter where the airpods if if your ears shaped the right way and most people's are um, shaped close enough to where you can just set the the AirPods in your ear like you do with your regular earbuds mm -hmm. that you get with your iPhone. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's been kind of nice. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't mind terribly sticking them in my ear canal. I did find out figure out that I need to get foam tips. I had to order in order my own tips for the ones that go in your ear. Um, mm. And and the, the the ear canal on one side is bigger than the ear canal on the other side. And so you think, oh, I put I put the same color pair on both sides and I can do that. But then one side's falling out. So um, mm. anyway, but uh, yeah, the, the ear insertion ones, the nice thing about those is that you don't have to turn them up as loud to drown out the world around you because mm -hmm. they're inserted into your ear canal. Uh, the Broggies mm -hmm. also they had a much, much wider range of um, uh, gestures you can do with them. And so, you know, you can, you can tap them, you can swipe up to turn it up, swipe down to turn it down. You can, uh, double tap your cheek and it'll, uh, call on Siri. Um, if you do the getting, AirPods have any controls built in, they do. So, um, by default, if you double tap the right, uh, AirPod, it will, uh, bring up Siri and then you can configure the left one to do something different. So I have that as a uh, play pause. Oh, I see. Cool. But but that's it. So you don't have any volume controls or anything on it, which I kind of miss. Um, mm -hmm. The other nice thing about the Broggies is they have a gesture where you shake your head. And so if you're getting a phone call and you don't want to answer it, you know, you, you you pull out your phone and it's a number you don't recognize. You just shake your head and it'll disconnect the call. Mm -hmm. So so that's nice. It only does it when it's ringing. Obviously, if you're talking to somebody on the phone, you shake your head. It's not going to hang up on them. So you've done lots of research. Are you going to do a full write-up on comparison of Yeah, I'm features? probably going to do uh, a video on YouTube and then, yeah, do a write-up on them. But 
Cool. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty gratified about some of the ones, some of the things that I've been getting that I get to try out. Um, mm-hmm. Another one that's also really cool, and I think I've picked this on a previous show, but what the hey, right? Um, there's a company out there called Astro Reality, and they do um, augmented virtual reality kind of thing on your phone. And they actually sell you models of the moon or models of like the planets in the solar system. And so you pull out, you turn on their app on your phone and point it at the model. And it gives you all kinds of information about the planet that you've got sitting in front of you. Um, So my son, my 12 year old's homeschooled and my wife is essentially going to rearrange his science lessons so that he does the solar system before I have to send them back. Um, Mm. Because, you know, mine are huh. review copies. I don't get to keep them. I get to keep the moon because I got those at a different conference. Um, and I have the Lunar Pro, which is the really big one. And it uh, it shows you all the moon landing sites. It shows you geography on the moon. Um, on the moon landing sites, you can play all the videos of all the moon landings. You can um, look at photographs that, they, you know, that the different lunar landers took. You, I mean, they, they have all the information about all of the landing sites and all of that stuff. So you can really see it on the moon. It's really cool. So, um, yeah, I've got review units of all of those. Some of the stuff that I saw, it wasn't that super exciting, and some of it was. So um, there were some connected devices like connected safes and connected uh, cookers. So um, they're, they're sending me review units of those, but... I mean, all, all it really does is you get an alert on your phone when the sous vide's been on for eight hours, right? Or however <laughs> long you set it for. And you can turn it on and off over the internet, which is nice. But, you know, and you can change the temperature and all that, obviously. But, it, you know, it's like, okay, that that's interesting, but not critically interesting. You know, the same thing with the safe. I can open the safe from, you know, from here. If it's connected to Wi-Fi, they just have to push a button to turn it on and then hmm. I can on my phone say and open. Um, you better really better really trust their security if you uh <laughs> yeah that, well huh? the thing is is that with that one if if nobody touches it for a while it just turns it turns itself off. And so mm-hmm. somebody has to be there and hit a button to turn it on so that it'll connect so that you can open it. So it's got some built in security that way. But anyway, just interesting stuff. Anyway, cool. if, pe- if people want to uh, hire Narwhal or watch and see what you're doing these days, where do they go? They should go to nrwl.io. So it's like Narwhal, but remove the vowels and the H. Yep. Uh, so four letters. Um, also, our, we we blog a lot at uh, blog.nrwl.io about a lot of Angular stuff and X related stuff. Basil, the, you know, the new build tool that yep. Google's open source and we're pretty big fans of. Um, so yeah, those are good places. Twitter as well. We're on NRWL underscore IO. If yeah. I think you could probably search for Narwhal Angular if you don't want to remember how we spell it. Yeah, it'll yeah. probably show up. Uh, and my personal Twitter is Jeff B Cross. And so um, I, I think I, I think I'm a pretty good person to follow on Twitter. I keep it pretty focused on Angular stuff, and only every once in a while I tweet some some stupid joke uh, that that no one appreciates. But um, other than that, I think I'm a pretty good account. Good deal. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you for coming, Jeff. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. We will wrap this up, and we'll come back at you next week with another Angular story. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.